Well, in my office upstairs, I have a plumb line. Does anyone know what a plumb line is? Many of us do. Younger generation, the millennials and people up to 30 go past my office and say, what's that? String with a little a, a weight. And so the Bible says the Word of God is our plumb line. The builders use plumb lines to make sure they hang it where they're going to build a wall to make sure the wall is straight. And the Word of God is our plumb line because we need to align our life to the Word of God. So, so as the Word of God comes forward, whether it's a prophetic word, a preached word, a taught word, whether you read the Word, we ask ourselves, am I living in line with the Word? So as we open the Scriptures today, let the Word of God speak to you and as it speaks to me every day in Jesus' name. Uh, the topic of my sermon is the fivefold, but the title of my message is Walking Worthy of Your Calling. We all know that uh, part of the vision that Pastor Corey has been sharing with us over two years now, that we are led by the collective strength of the fivefold ministry. And so we find all five in Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 17. If you have your Bibles there, you can open up there. If you don't, you can open up your Bibles, uh, you, can, you can open up your phones, your pads, your devices, your memory, and if you don't have any of those, you can look up onto the screen. Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, Paul writes, urge you to walk in a matter, in a matter worthy of your calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. So when we see in Scripture something being repeated, we know it's being repeated for a reason. That's the topic of the passage. It's the theme of the passage. This is talking about our calling, your calling and my calling. We often think about you know those in full-time ministry as being called, called to be a pastor, called to be a prophet, called to full-time ministry. But every single believer is called. We're called to be disciples, we're called to be sons and daughters, and we're called to serve. And this is about our calling. This passage is about our calling. It says, There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us. Everyone say, to each one of us. Can you say, to me? Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, Jesus has given us gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended... What does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill or literally fulfill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until... We all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children. God does not want us to be infants spiritually or in any other way. Children are tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness. In deceitful schemes, but rather, as we've already heard, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up, speaking maturity again, in every way into him, Christ, who is the head, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, Here's this word, each again. Each one of us has been given grace. Each one of us is called. Each one of us has been given gifts. And when each does its part properly, 
makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now I, this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. The Apostle Paul begins this passage by writing to the Christians in the church at Ephesus about walking worthy of their calling. And then he talks about how to do that and then he says at the very end, don't walk as the Gentiles walk. So walk according to calling but not as the Gentiles which you used to be. So the Gentiles basically, and we don't have time to unpack that, but they lived in their sensual lives, in their paganism, they lived basically for themselves. So walking worthy of the calling to which we've been called is living for Jesus, living with Jesus and for Jesus according to the purpose that he has planned for us. And that's for every single one of us. So we each have a calling. I have a calling. You have a calling. Every single one of us is called to be a minister of the gospel, a servant of Christ, because each one of us has been given various special gifts. If you, if you have Christ, you have special gifts with which to serve. You've been given gifts. You've been given grace. This is not just for some. There is no clergy laity divide in the Bible. Everybody has been given gifts. Statistics in the Western, particularly the Western middle class church, have told us over and over again about 10%, some churches 20% are involved in serving. The statistics are similar for, for evangelising and tithing as well. The three things that I was taught as a brand new Christian was serving, evangelising and tithing. All of us are called to those three things, but they're statistically the things that we do the least. Now, I'm not saying you do, I'm not saying our church necessarily does, but statistically, the vast majority of churches, only about 10 to 20% tithe, 10 to 20% evangelise, 10 to 20% are involved in some form of active ministry. And this passage is about our active ministry. When Jesus ascended, he gave gifts to people. Every single one of us. We know from Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul uses the analogy of the body. Everybody is like a part of the body and they have a role to play. Every single one of us, not just the executive, not just the full-time staff, every single body. Every single person. You have spiritual gifts given to you And just as we read in the parable of the talents, which really is predominantly about finances, but it's about everything Christ has given us as stewards, he wants a return on his investment. But he's given us gifts so that when we serve, everybody else benefits. The only gift we receive that is benefiting us is the gift of tongues. He who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, every other gift we have, every other ability he has given us is to serve for the blessing and the benefit of others for the common good. And so <clears throat> we each have to grow in our service. When I was a brand new Christian, I was led to the Lord by Pastor Dr. Alamai, my friend, my pastor, my mentor for 41 and a half years. He's taught me so much. I was called to Bible college uh, five months after I got saved, and I I didn't know anything. In fact, we used to go out on a Friday night evangelising in the streets of Ringwood, and I remember standing on a vegetable crate, preaching outside of Eastland before it was redeveloped and it was a big uh, mall as it is now. It was much smaller, more like Churnside Park or a smaller mall. And I used to remember standing on a vegetable crate, preaching about Jesus, Weeks after I got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, demons cast out of me, speaking in tongues, knowing God, knowing the cleansing and the washing of the blood of Jesus, my life transformed. But I hadn't been discipled, so I didn't know what I was saying yet. Can you imagine 80 people listening to this 20-year-old guy, telling them they need Jesus without explaining anything? (laughs) I must have sounded like a real deal. (laughs) So Alan said to me when I was called to college, he said, Mikey, 
you better come over every week and I better teach you the words so you don't look like a total ignoramus when you go to Bible college. There is only one thing worse than being a total ignoramus and that is looking like a total ignoramus. And he had compassion on me. He didn't want me to be one or look like one. So five o'clock, one morning a week for the whole year, I would go to Alan's place. He would open the door, turn on the stove, cook me poached eggs on toast, best poached eggs I've ever had on toast, give me good strong coffee so we were both awake and then he would teach the word. Open the scriptures about who I was in Christ, about how to serve, about how to live, about what the scriptures teach about Jesus, about the basic doctrines, about my life and my life of service and what's important to God. All those things every morning for a whole year. And I, I think when I got to college, I wasn't a total ignoramus. So thank you, bro. I'm so grateful. But I was called, but I didn't know I was called. And I began to serve. And so when I got to Bible college, we were planning churches back then. And uh, I, I said to the dean, I'm not involved in any ministry. What can I do? Well, I was a young Christian. I didn't know what my ministry was. I didn't know I was going to be a teacher or pastor or leader. I just wanted to do something. He said, well, what can you do? I said, not much. So I played my guitar in chapel for, for the college students. So I knew about three songs. One of them was, This is the Day That the Lord Has Made. How many know that one? That's a goodie, but an oldie, you know, in the key of D. I knew, I knew three chords and three songs, and they were all in the key of D. And so he said, why don't you go and play worship for the four children in the church plant in Churchside Park? I said, I can do that. So I began playing my guitar, and we'd always finish with this is the day that the Lord has made. And the children didn't know that I wasn't very good because they just sang with all their heart. They have simple faith and they encouraged me and they thanked me. And it was a good experience. And I can still only play three chords and this is the day that the Lord has made 40 years later. But that's not my ministry. That's not my calling. I'm not really that musical. I just love playing it to worship. And, and the, when I worship, the Lord has this filtering system has got some thing where I don't stand out of tune and my, I'm not out of time and when I miss a chord he doesn't mind because he just loves the worship. But then one day the pastor of the church plant said to me, Mike, why don't you lead uh, communion next Sunday? So I thought, okay, I can do that. I know what they do. So I read the scriptures. I prayed the night before and the Lord said to me when I finished preparing just a few thoughts about communion, he said, Mike, when when you're about to get up, I want you to share this word with a lady. And I say, well, how will I know which lady that is? She's going to come in and she's going to be carrying a blue handbag. So I'm sitting up the front of the church checking out all the women <laughs> to see if they've got a blue handbag. Nothing else. But I did feel, I hope no one sees me looking at all the women because I don't normally do that. The last woman to come in, she had a blue handbag. And I'm really nervous because in chapel at Bible college, we would have a time of prophecy. And I would get up and say, for thus saith the Lord, because we read the King James back then and your prophecies had to reflect that. For thus saith the Lord, God loves you. And I sat down. And that was the extent of my prophecies. Well, now God's talking to me about a woman and her marriage and her situation and her pain and healing and God's plan for her. I'd never received a word like that before. So I asked the pastor if it would be okay to share that with her. And he said, yes. And he gave me some guidance. So I did that. And it transformed her life. Just a word like that. that not that I spoke, but God would speak to someone to encourage her in that way. Well, then I needed instruction about that. I needed instruction about a lot of things. And this is what the fivefold are for, to equip us to serve. This is why we have the fivefold on staff. Let me quickly go through what the fivefold are. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. So you shall see up here, the apostle. The apostle, the word for apostle means one who is sent. One who is sent and one who scales, one who builds, one who uh, expands. His, his ministry is all about impact. He wants to send and extend the kingdom. This is the internal motivation of an apostle. Build the kingdom, expand the kingdom, go to where it isn't. We've gone to Perth to reach people. 
who, are, who don't know Jesus yet. That's why we're planting. That's apostolic language. There's an ancient document preceding Christ that talks about um, the kingdom of Rome sending out an armada of ships to a land that doesn't belong to them in order to conquer that land. They would send soldiers, naval people, they would send administrators, educators, agriculturists. So when the soldiers capture that city or that nation for, for Rome, it becomes part of the kingdom of Rome. That entire armada was called the apostle. They went to expand the kingdom of Rome. And the admiral, or whatever the title they had, who was the, the person in charge of that armada, he was called an apostle, the apostle. So it was an apostolic move to capture and extend the kingdom of Rome. When Jesus called his disciples together one day, he had prayed all night and he designated them apostles. The central message that Jesus preached from the beginning of his ministry to the end of the ministry, which continued through the uh, early church throughout the book of Acts is the kingdom of God. He came to establish his kingdom and to expand his kingdom and he chose apostles to do that, not priests, not pastors, not teachers, apostles because they are motivated and driven to expand. That's the apostle, the prophet, one who reveals and reforms integrity of God's word, one who speaks for God into the present situation or the future, prediction. So Pastor uh, Steve, when he got up here and prophesied, I should probably call you Prophet Steve, not Pastor Steve. It's a little bit of lingo that we use. We call everybody pastor, it's a sign of honour, but he's a prophet. When he came, he, he's speaking what God wants to say to us here today. He wasn't prophesying about the future, which sometimes happens. He's speaking into this situation. The evangelist, Pastor Cherie, our evangelist, one who excites and invites, motivated by including people into the kingdom through the preaching of the gospel. An evangelist is one who declares the good news. The good news is evangelion, and the evangelist, evangelistes, is the one who preaches the good news in order to bring people to Christ. The shepherd, one who protects the one provides by investing into the lives of people, watching over people. Pastor is the same word for shepherd in the New Testament. And so the teacher, one who explains, one who trains, one who instructs, that's what I'm trying to do now. One who helps people understand God's word and to know how to walk according to it. And so we have fivefold on our executive. We talk about our fivefold in terms of seven pillars. We have the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teacher and operations and business because we can't do what we do as fivefold without operations and business. We, we are a team. So when we, on our exec, talk about fivefold, we think seven pillars and we need all of us. So why were the apest or the fivefold given to the church? Well, to equip the church, as I explained, I have been trained in evangelising before I even knew what I was evangelising about. I was trained in teaching. When I was a baby Christian, uh, Dr. Alamai gave me a couple of Martin Lloyd-Jones books on Romans, expositions of Romans chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2. I needed a dictionary right next to the book I was reading because there were so many terms I didn't understand. They were biblical terms. But I got into the Word. And Alan instructed me in the Scriptures, in doctrine, in the ways of God, in discipleship. The fivefold are to equip us for the work of the ministry. The word equip is this word catatismos. Now you'll see that here means to put in order, to restore, restore to its former condition, put into proper condition, complete, make complete, prepare, make ready, equip, all those sorts of things. We read that the fishermen were mending their nets. This word is used. A disciple fully trained will be like his teacher. I'm a little bit like Alan. I don't preach as well as Alan, but I'm a little bit like that. My heart, my motivation and the the basic understanding of the scriptures I have are because of what he has taught me. The word to restore the one who is caught in sin. This is this word. God prepared a body for Jesus in his incarnation. He prepared, equipped, he made ready. 
The universe was created by the Word of God. It's this made ready for the use that God had for the earth. And again in Hebrews, equipped with every good uh, thing to do God's will. So our role is to be equipped. The role of the fivefold is to equip us. We each have gifts to use and they need to be sharpened. They need to be trained. They need to be uh, utilised. We can't make anybody utilise them, but we can certainly train you to utilise them. So our role as a congregation is to present ourselves to be used, to be trained, to be equipped, to be made ready according to the calling that God has placed upon us. And every one of us is called, remember? Not some of us. Every one of us has been given gifts. Not some of us. So we all need to be equipped in the things that God's called us to do. When I was a young uh, boy, I started playing baseball. Well, I was a very average sports person. I wasn't far, strong. My son, Ben, was 10 times the athlete physically that I am. I was average. But I got to play for baseball for Australia when I was 18 because I had great coaches. I have been batting above my weight my entire life. I have a doctorate now. And Alan and I did our doctorates together through Denver Seminary. I am average. I I failed year 11 twice and then year 12, three years in a row, because I bummed around. I I wasn't disciplined. I didn't get study. I did my degree in theology as an adult when I finally got this thing called study. So I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I had good teachers. My, My doctoral work was pretty substantial on on the area of mentoring. I had a great doctoral mentor. He used to be the director of the doctoral program. My first work I submitted about our project and my thesis was like a glorified Bible study. So he just said, do this, do this. I rewrote rewrote about 12 times. And then when he said, it's ready to submit to the doctoral committee, when I submitted it, they passed it straight away. So I said, they passed it. He said, they don't normally do that. They've never done that first time. It wasn't because I was smart, it's just that he knew what I needed to do. And he taught me how to do that. He's my, he, was, he mentored me, he, co- he equipped me. He made me ready. So that has opened up an awful lot of learning for me and the ability to help others in that area. I could not have done that by myself. I could not have played baseball for Australia by myself. I was trained, I was equipped, I was discipled from the get-go. You know, the scripture says, until we all reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, which is a unified set of convictions about Christ, we have a unity about that. Scripture says, we are to be equipped for the ministry that God has called us, equipped us for the ministry of the saints. What ministry? The ministry that God has given you to do. So we have a lot of people involved in ministry in this church. I don't know if every one of you is involved. If you're not, we're looking forward to you getting engaged because we need you to be engaged because you have gifts others don't have. You have a role to play no one else has. When everybody is serving according to their gifting, then everybody else is benefiting and the church matures. This word matures is the Greek word teleos, which the Greeks used to use this for the finish line of a marathon. So someone who is mature is someone who's finished the race, someone who's passed all of the stages and has finished. It's a maturity. It's not a perfection. As some of the uh, English translations use this word perfect, our Western mindset of perfect is flawless um, without any uh, mistakes or blemishes. But the New Testament word for perfect is this word mature where it doesn't doesn't matter how long it takes you, you, but you finish because you've run the race, you've fought the good fight, but you've been involved, you've been engaged. And there are talks about attaining to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. These words are a picture of like like an, an old blacksmith in his 60s or 70s, and he's got a young 14 year old apprentice The old blacksmith, he's learned everything about his trade and he's using that and he's passing it on to someone else. When we've learned everything there is to learn about 
growing and maturing in the things that God has called us to do. And we use our gifts and we serve others and we bless others and we benefit their growth, their maturity, their walk with Jesus, their service. We all together grow up and become more like Christ. We, we attain to the fullness and the stature, not of a perfect Christian, but the fullness of Christ. We become like him then. The church becomes like Christ when everybody is engaged in using the gifts that God has given them when they are equipped and trained by the fivefold. It's a team thing. It's a team thing. So when we do that, we become mature. We don't become like any children anymore. So what does this mean for us? Well, in summary, each one of us has a unique calling. I have a unique calling. I'm a very unique individual. Some say I'm peculiar. I think I am. Some say I'm very weird. I cannot disagree with that. But you know, every one of us is peculiar. Particular. We're individuals. This is not uniformity. Paul in this passage didn't talk about uniformity. Everyone doing the same thing. This is about unity, everybody doing their thing that God has called them to do. And when everybody does their thing, the body works. Can you imagine if 20% of the body functioned, if if 20% of my body functioned, I would be referred to as disabled. A person whose body doesn't work properly is referred to as disabled. They have disabilities whether it's paralysis or some other deformity or an illness. When 20% of the church works, you've got to say the church is not fully abled, is it? We're partially disabled. And I don't think people are lazy. I think people want to get engaged. Perhaps we just haven't been discipled well and we haven't understood these things. So each of us has a unique calling, our God-given purpose. If you want to know what your purpose is, Read the scriptures about doing the things that all of us are called to do, but then discover what that particular purpose that God has given you to do. And don't do those gift profiles online. People like me get 100% in everything. Other people with low self-esteem get zero in everything, and it's confusing. Talk to someone who walks with Jesus, who's walked with Jesus for a long time. And they'll ask you, what's in your heart? What are you able to do? What are you capable? What's God speaking to you about? There are really helpful ways of discovering these things. So each of you have been given a gift, and that is your ministry. And then when we use that, we all grow together. You know, the church is not a spectator sport. If we look at a sporting arena that is a, a full stadium with players, and I watch... The, the football last night, I buried for Carlton. Don't, you know, he, we've been on the bottom for a long time, so we're sort of building our way up. But I watched the footy, there were some spectators there, but can you imagine the MCG on grand final day when there's no COVID? Full stadium, full players. They're all there. Then can you imagine during COVID when we used to watch the footy, there's players on the field and there's no spectators? Can you imagine an empty arena... With players on the field, this is the church. There are no spectators in the church. Everybody gets to play. Every one of us gets to play. So what's our response? Well, here I have a few buckets, a few containers. You can see this thing here, a little cup, communion-sized cup. Outside, we have rented a slurpy machine for your enjoyment today, since it's so hot. <laughs> I take full responsibility for that. I was not at my prophetic best. But when I used to come to Allen for discipling and I went to college for learning and training, I brought a full bucket. I wanted to learn so much. I had a lot to learn. Can you imagine? See, every year 7-Eleven have a, a special promo day where you can take it a big mug and cost you nothing. Can you imagine taking a communion cup, fill this up with bubblegum slurpy juice thing, you know? Who's going to do that? We are going to do this because we want a lot of slurpy. 
We want to suck that thing till it's coming out of our ears. Somebody might do one of these, but it's unlikely. No one's going to do this. This is how we present ourselves to the Lord and to the church. Let's come with our big bucket. I've got a lot to learn. I want to learn. I want to learn. I want to present myself to be taught because I have a unique contribution to make. And that's our attitude. Come with your big bucket. Every one of us has a role to play. And if you didn't bring your bucket, there'll be buckets out there next to the Slurpee machine. You can get one for free for your enjoyment. And as you leave, remember that Slurpee's there for a reason. Get the biggest lot of learning you can get and come with an open heart and open attitude of learning. Of, Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up, church. Fill me up, prophet. Fill me up, apostle. Fill me up. Teach me, train me, equip me, get me involved. And then Newman Church is going to be like Newman Church has never been before. 